The Demeter Code by Russell Brooks Music composed by Jeremy Vago For previous episodes, visit russellparkway.com Chapter 3, Part 1 Bar le Griffon Place Fauche Montauban, France 10.05 a.m. Saturday Ridley Fox took a swig from his bottle of Heineken as he watched Manchester United score another goal against FC Barcelona. There weren't any loud cheers, nor any cantankerous groaning around him from rowdy, boisterous European football fans. After all, Eurospar was only showing the plays of the week. It was a slow early part of the afternoon, as the only company Fox had were two men shooting pool, a waitress, a man sitting four bar stools away, and the owner, who was presumably in his office in the back. Although they all looked harmless, at the right price, they could be a threat. Fox knew the game all too well, which was why he wouldn't allow himself to get too inebriated. Fox had taken on several different identities and many different faces in the past. This evening, he was David Conlon, the mercenary whose last hit ended with a drug lord and a handful of his associates' body parts floating off the shores of Cartagena. Originally, the CIA's goal was for Fox to recruit Conlon. That plan fell through, leaving Fox with no other option but to take him out. He not only got his ass chewed up by his superior, General Paul Downing, but also by the new Director of Central Intelligence, DCI Sue Ellen Merrick. For the CIA, a killer was an asset, for Fox and for anyone else who had been a SEAL, or in his case, a former Joint Task Force 2 warrant officer, otherwise known as a JTF-2, Canada's version of the SEALs. It's hard to negotiate when you're about to be killed. Actually, the General understood concerning his military history. As for Merrick, forget it. Fox being fluent in 12 languages in addition to being a skilled impersonator, Replacing Conlon wasn't difficult, and the fact that very few people saw his real face only helped Fox. His natural hair color was dark auburn, and he was normally clean-shaven, but for the past several weeks, Fox let a full beard grow an inch, dyed black with specks of gray, which was close to Conlon's last known appearance. Presently, he wore slightly used cross trainers and an old pair of loose-fitting jeans a thick black windbreaker, and a concealed Glock 19. It was pretty cool for this day near the end of November, only 44 Fahrenheit. Taking on someone else's identity was so common for Fox that it became second nature. Ever since the CIA had recruited him after the JTF-2 no longer had any use for him, he lived the life of a ghost. He lost count of the number of people he had been over the years. Whenever he needed fake travel documents, cash, a sidearm, access to a local safe house. It would all be provided for him. Items he'd need while in the field would come to him in the form of a dead drop. Now as Conlon, he'd get among the inner circle of Manzer al Ghaffari, a notorious Syrian-born arms dealer and a royal pain in the ass to the U.S. and to most European authorities. Like others such as al Ghaffari, they always did business with bigger fish. One of his clients, was known to be former CIA informer turned terrorist, Fauzi al Yumari. This guy had earned his spot as America's most wanted terrorist for the bombings of two American embassies in Egypt and in Morocco, respectively. He's also claimed responsibility for the bombing of a cruise line, killing six American passengers. His supplier, al Ghaffari, was such a thorn in America's side that he was even wanted by the DEA's Special Operations Division since the late 1980s. Back then, they once had what they thought was once a solid case against him for smuggling drugs into New York. Of course, the case was thrown out when some key witnesses suddenly disappeared. It wasn't until Congress passed the Patriot Act after 9-11, a bill that would give law enforcement agencies more powers to arrest anyone whom they suspected were related to terrorist activities, that the DAA thought of performing a sting operation against him 
that would land his ass in jail. But, where men like Algafari attracted powerful friends who hated the West, he'd also attract other enemies such as the CIA. Fox's superiors managed to convince the DEA to hold off on going after Algafari, at least until Yumari was either captured or killed. Once that was done, Fox would pass any additional intel on Algafari to the DEA to help them nail him. Gaining Algafari's trust was another complicated matter. His inner circle was so tight, including friends within the Centro Nacional de Inteligencia, Spain's National Intelligence Service, who provided him with protection in exchange for him giving him intel. Becoming friends with him wasn't going to be easy. To America's advantage, a Greek national by the name of Costas Viglakis was already in their custody, and he was well acquainted with Algafari. For the past several months, a DA agent cozied up to Viglakis and eventually became friends with him. When Viglakis was comfortable with him, the DA agent began bringing him traditional Greek meals. Viglakis couldn't resist the keftathis, the pork souvlaki, or even uvetsi. He even bought a mela macaronas, the honey walnut cookies that were a favorite around Christmas. Eventually, they struck a deal that his prison sentence would be commuted in exchange for him meeting with Algafari and then recommending Conlon to him. The whole operation took a year to set up. To their chagrin, Algafari eventually took the bait. From what Viglakis told the DEA, Algafari was interested in having Conlon to do little things for him. Fox took another sip of his Heineken. And after he put it down, he couldn't help but stare at it while wondering when he'd be contacted. He doubted that Algafari would leave his palace-like mansion in Marbella to meet him here. One of his associates would most likely be doing so instead. And even though it came with the job, Fox hated waiting on others. The casual observer may see Fox focusing on a Heineken bottle. However, from where he sat... He had a partial view of the front door, watching who came and who left, and the rest of the bar as well. If anyone thought that they could jump him, they'd be limping away. That's if he afforded them the chance to do so. The man who sat four bar stools away began to be of concern. He had checked his cell phone three times in the past two minutes. After the last time, he texted something. Fox also noticed that he had two beers while barely watching the television, and he wasn't speaking to anyone. He doubted that the man, if he was involved in some form of ambush, would be directly participating with two beers in his system. He'd be too busy taking a piss that he'd end up messing up the timing of a planned hit. However, he may be a watchman for a hit. Fox never once stared in his direction, but he caught him stealing glances at him at least five times. Whatever he was up to, Fox would let him make the first move. There was a jingling in the doorway, and another man entered. The same guy looked over his shoulder, and a smile came to his face, followed by him saying, Jacques! He slid off his bar stool and went to Jacques with outstretched arms, and exchanged hugs. They then left together. Old friends? A gay couple? Who knows? Who cares? There were now three people left in the bar, plus the owner in the back. Just as the door was about to click shut, it was pushed back open by another man. The two men at the pool table simultaneously looked at him. The way that he walked was the first thing that Fox noticed, as he appeared to be favoring his right leg. However subtle, it was enough for Fox to guess that it may have resulted from a previous injury. When Jacques had entered, the two men at the pool table barely paid him any attention. It wasn't the same for this guy. Within moments of him entering, Fox caught both of them glance at him and then briefly at each other before returning to their game. That was a bright flapping red flag. These three men were acquainted. How? It didn't matter. The new arrival sat down adjacent to Fox where he rudely called out to the waitress to bring him a beer. He wore a thin wool coat, 
had a small crop of brown hair on his head and a thick moustache. Again, Fox kept facing the TV while surreptitiously watching the patron, whom Fox knew was watching him. The waitress came by and placed a beer in front of him. Aimerez-vous d'autres choses? she asked him. He answered her with a shake of the head and a backhanded wave. Fox saw the corner of her lips curl into a sneer before she walked away with her cabaret. He felt like saying something to the jerk, such as, Can't you at least say thanks? A long time ago, he would have done just that. And back in his early high school days, when he was a scrawny, 120-pound weakling, who would often be taunted and bullied by older kids, they picked on him because he could never fight back. Actually, he tried, only to get his ass kicked for it. His best friend at the time, Mark, could only be there for moral support, being that he was confined to a wheelchair. Mark was actually better in all of his classes than Fox, and would often help him with his homework. In return, Fox would take the hits for him whenever the smart-ass kids came around. He couldn't fight them. Fox knew what he did was dangerous. But Mark was the only real friend that he had. The jerk who currently sat adjacent from Fox reminded him of one of those older kids. He just wasn't as well-dressed, with probably more ego than common sense. The man nodded once at Fox. Hey, toi! T'es nouveau ici, toi! You're new here. Fox ignored him. He expected the man to start off by calling out to him, and he'd be persistent in doing so until Fox acknowledged his presence. The man slapped the counter twice with an open palm. Toi là! Je te parle! Fox took out his android and pretended to check it, then put it away to watch the television, which was showing a dish soap commercial. The man slid off his bar stool, took his beer, and made his way over to Fox, who noticed the waitress disappear through a door behind the counter. He already knew that there was a baseball bat hidden behind the cash register. If a fight was about to happen, she must have known that the bat wouldn't be much use. She was about to warn her boss, who would then probably return with a sawed-off shotgun. Then again... Keeping a firearm hidden beside the cash register would have been more ideal, which could mean that the owner probably anticipated that bullets would be flying. Fox had underestimated Algafari's connections. Someone must have tipped him off as to Fox not being the real David Conlon, and this was how the favor was being returned. An entire twelve-month op gone to waste. He could escape through the back. But who knew what, or who may be waiting for him? Getting out through the front was the simplest and smartest route. Aside from Mustache Man, the pool players would attempt to block him. And aside from their sticks, they most likely had their sidearms duct taped underneath the table. This concludes Chapter 3, Part 1. Stay tuned for the final episode of The Demeter Code. Coming next week.